So again, welcome to uh, our second meeting for the budget focus group. I got a lot to cover. There we go. Okay, introductions. I know there were some people that were not here at the, the first meeting. So if you could, for those that weren't here, maybe just give a little wave of your hand and just share with us uh, your name, your connection to the district and what you hope to learn. So who wants to start? Lori. Oh, I'm Lori Stone, I'm a school board member, and um, I'm just excited to be a part of the budget planning process. That's right. Rob Allen, I teach middle school English, and I'm just here to, again, learn more about the budget. I've done this a few times, and I feel like Every time I'm learning a little bit more, so maybe this time I'll know it all. Then you can present. But yes, hopefully, <laughs> the dream. Karen. Uh, Karen Zyra, and I have two boys that graduated in district, um, and I'm just you know, as a mom, and I like to know all the numbers. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Roman. I'm Roman Schott. Very fancy nameplate. Uh, <laughs> Just a senior at Spencer Floor and a student representative here because I mean, I think it would be quite a valuable experience for me. Great, great to have you, Roman. Mr. Allen. Corey Allen, Chief Information Officer. I'm going to echo Mr. Allen's sentiments. I've done this a few times, but every time um, I learn something new, I appreciate Bert's uh, work in this area. Anyone else I missed? Oh, Megan. Megan Sarkis, uh, Board of Education member. I'm just here. I just Love bricks, presentation. <laughs> You're the love. Yes, yeah. you might, and it, I better end now. <laughs> so, okay, so again, a lot to get through tonight. A lot of this we're going to talk about what the governor has projected in her 23 24 executive budget. This slide shares uh, all of the billions of dollars that she has allocated to schools throughout the district. Uh, it's a change of $3 billion or close to just under uh, 10%. The majority of that, uh, as you'll see throughout the presentation, is the first line item of foundation aid. Uh, many of the others are what they call expense driven aids. Um, and quite honestly, the third meeting, we're really going to get into the details of how these are allocated and derived. Part of tonight will be showing you some uh, state aid factors that help drive how those aids are calculated. So again, uh, pretty big dollar number when you're looking at this. So again, foundation aid being the largest uh, piece of the puzzle and the 23-24 foundation aid formula or how you're gonna get determine your aid amount is you take the current year foundation aid and then you add the higher of either the 100%, what they call the 100% phase in or what they call a hold harmless 3%. For Spencer Port, we qualified for the 100% phase in, which you're gonna see is about $4.5 million for different reasons. This slide um, was shared during one of the presentations from um, Questar Financial Planning. And I thought it was very interesting because it shows you <clears throat> In 22-23, it was sort of the first slash second year of the fully phased in foundation aid. In order to get all school districts to where they need to be, based on the formula, that's another $1.3 billion, so that in total, it's $2.6 billion. And then to hold those districts, what they call hold harmless, it added another, so there's $2.7 billion um, in her budget. Again, pretty, pretty big numbers. For many years, uh, under Governor Cuomo, really what happened was the formula ran, the state could not fully fund the foundation aid formula. They didn't have the money to do so. In addition, it's when the recession hit. And what Governor Cuomo did in many years was hold our foundation aid flat. So we were not receiving any additional aid where we should have received at least some based on the formula. And that's what this graph is showing. You can see that 
in um, 21, 22, 22, 23 in particular, and now 23, 24, um, the foundation aid payable versus what the total foundation aid should be is now matching. The question is, as we go through this, is going to be, how are we going to sustain that? So again, um, another graph that I thought was interesting, uh, taken from the Questar meeting, but this actually comes from the Office of the State Comptroller, where it shares with you the blue is what they call the allowable levy growth factor. That's what many of you uh, hear about when they talk about the tax cap and that 2%. So in other words, when we go through the tax cap calculations at the next meeting, um, you're gonna see the different uh, calculations and it's gonna be the lesser of um, 2% or um, below. <clears throat> now, the orange bar is the actual inflation factor. You can see in 22 it was 4.7 and right now 8% and foundation aid, is based on the orange bar. So what that means, whoops, is that <clears throat> the, the, the reason that it's such a large increase is that they're doing the final phase in based on the formula, but there's also that 8% inflation. So again, what happens in the future? And we're gonna talk about that in the coming meetings about how we look at long range planning to help gauge and put us in the financial position um, that we're in. So again, future increases, there's not gonna be any change to the formula. So if the inflation rate is gonna go down, that means we're not gonna receive as much foundation aid. Any questions as it relates to some of the general information? So I just wanted to have a little bit of fun with this slide. I know this is probably not fun for you, it's fun for me, however, this is the formula for foundation aid. It is, uh, it's crazy, really. I mean, the Questar had a, a webinar just on foundation aid alone on the different factors that impact how that number is derived. So again, things that I think the advocacy groups are out there uh, talking to SED, to the governor's office, is a lot of this information is based on the 2000 census data. Okay, we're, we're 20 years past that, right? Um, plus, um, it talks about the, what we call the FERPL, the free and reduced price lunch. So how does that impact different things? Especially now, over the last two years, where everyone was had a free lunch, right? Now it's this year, it's gone back to uh, the original um, uh, free and, and reduced price uh, applications. And they talk about regional uh, cost indexes. How does that measure up in the different regions uh, within the state? Within the governor's budget, within the foundation aid, there's a little bit of um, a tweak to it where they uh, have set aside what they call high impact tutoring. So if the district has an increase in foundation aid of 3% and greater than 100,000. So again, does anyone remember what our estimated foundation aid is gonna be? 4.5 million. 4.5 million. So I think we would yeah. qualify for that and that. So now how do you calculate that? It's the greater of 100,000 or 11.77% of the increase above 3%. So, um, I was fortunate, I actually was looking at our state aid runs, and then I actually, um, again, looked at what they provided and I actually got the same number. So I was pleased with that. For us, it is uh, $445,433. So there's some, I'm gonna call stipulations with this set aside. You, um, it's gonna have to deliver small group or individual tutoring sessions, reading and math for those at-risk students. The districts will determine who those student at-risk students are and whether they uh, meet the uh, qualifications of being at risk. Um, I think the, one, the fourth paragraph down, I think is important. Uh, she'll only be used to supplement and not supplant. So in other words, you can't, if you're doing something now that addresses this, 
technically speaking, you can't use that and apply it to do and meet the needs of this particular set aside. It has to be new. The other option or the other fact of this is that <clears throat> this is a deduction from our foundation aid. It's not in addition to. So you'll see we're at about um, th that 445,000 is going to be sub subtracted <clears throat> from um, our foundation aid. Uh, any questions as it relates to anything I've covered so far? Mark, well, I do have one question. Yep. Tutoring during school day or after, or it's not specified? Uh, so I think it is, it's, um, is it in there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, third period. Okay. During the school day, before or after the school day, on the weekend, but must occur no less than twice per week. Okay. Okay, any questions on the foundation aid before we sort of roll into some of the other um, items that were uh, within our budget? Okay, so expense based, based aids, those are aids that you spend now, and then based on that amount, you will receive aid afterward. Transportation aid is one of those, um, BOCES aid is another example. So, Fortunately, there were very few changes as it related to that. In years past, there were a multitude of changes that would potentially really impact school districts. Um, we're fortunate that that didn't uh, move forward. The projections that you're seeing, remember, they are just projections. Okay, ultimately, the legislature has to approve the budget. And then remember that these are based on information that was in what they call the November database. As we move forward, um, we continually provide the state with information and they'll then take the information as of what the, the February 15th database and provide updates to that. The one hiccup to this is they do try to push through what they call the perennial freeze. So in other words, whatever they share with you in November is what they want to freeze your aid at <clears throat> when they adopt the budget. So if there's been changes that have occurred between November and February, those changes would not be done. And again, that would probably have a pretty significant impact because there's, there's purchases that we make during that time period that may not have been um, uh, included in those runs. So that could potentially impact the districts. Universal pre-K was another large item that the governor um, put money towards. And we're going to see a little bit how that impacts the Spencer Court. But I just wanted to, to highlight <clears throat> this is going to require um, more reporting. You can ask Ty if that's his favorite thing to do. He probably, he and I, I think over the last week and a half, have probably spent the majority of, of our time completing um, the different surveys within the portal to address all of the particular requirements that the state is um, asking for, which rightly so. They're being asked by the federal government in large part because of federal stimulus to make sure that we're using the federal monies that we've received um, appropriately. Right, Ty? Yes. <laughs> I, again, I thought this was an interesting slide. It does share with you the amount of um, pre-K money that has been put forth through um, the governor. The federal stimulus was really the, um, the seed money that started this. Moving forward, it's supposed to be state funded only. Uh, again, I think the question will become, will the governor and the legislature hold true to that? Um, it's some, again, some pretty big um, dollars. Although it really doesn't have a financial impact now, uh, we are gonna have to do another report for what they call the zero emission school buses, not electric. And, um, cautioned on that term because there may be other options, but zero emission. Uh, again, those are the types of things that we're going to have to uh, identify. Um, so this for me is a wait and see. I mean, you're talking a lot about uh, an increase in the cost for buses. The uh, aid reimbursement time is longer. So you're not receiving the money as quickly as you are. We have to talk about infrastructure. How are we going to charge the buses? Are they going to be built so that they can, you know, 
last during one of our winters. There's a lot that this um, that this will impact. So more to follow on this. Okay, I'm going to come close to wrapping up sort of the governor's budget. So this again is from the uh, what I call NICOS, New York State Council of um, Superintendents. And this is a, a pretty decent way for uh, you to see what the governor's proposal is and how it impacts the report. So you can see that the total aid is 5.5 million, a total aid excluding building aid because we're actually seeing a decrease there, okay? Is 6.5 or close to 20%. So what I'm gonna share with you is when we get into these next few meetings, um, those will not be the final numbers because of the way some of them are determined. Um, we go in and, and we take a look at that um, and we make adjustments. So um, I'll share with you right now, it will not be that high. I also just want to share again, I spoke a little bit about the uh, dollars uh, being invested into um, universal pre-K. Just remember, although it shows up on our state aid run, the accounting for that is actually in the federal fund, okay, which is a completely separate fund. And although you're seeing a $1.2 million uh, total, that doesn't mean that we can actually spend 1.2 million. It can if we need the number of students that that applies for. But the way this program works is that you get a per pupil amount, and depending upon the number of students that are in the program, you get that equivalent per pupil value. The per pupil value for the 22-23 um, uh, top line is different than the number for the $229,000, which is different for the number than $493,000. So again, working with Ty, with Cabinet, um, trying to identify the number of pre-K students that we can uh, meet um, will determine uh, the amount that we actually receive in federal aid. Any questions on the governor's information? I hope you guys are eating your chocolate because it's uh, pretty quiet here. Okay, so I'm going to buzz through these quite honestly. There a lot, it's a lot of um, analyticals. The details are really devils in the details. Um, but again, these are different things that we look at and help drive what's uh, how our aids are uh, calculated. So let's just take a look. So the first one, two, three, four um, are all averages, and then it compares it to the state average. So this is the same information, but in graphic form. Just take a minute. So again, the orange is Spencer Port's values. The values in red are the state values. That's the average for the state. So what are you seeing across all four graphs? Exactly. So what that means is that we may most likely receive more aid because we're not trying to be as quote unquote wealthy as other districts. Which leads us really to this next slide. This is what they call the combined wealth ratio. Um, you can see that the top line it's a red bar. Typically, if you're if you're at a value of one, okay, you're an average wealth district. Okay, if you're above one, then you're above wealth, uh, a wealthier district. You can see that we've um, you know been pretty steady. I think we're at what's that number there? Yep. About 0.661% of the 1.65 of the one. So how do we then compare in this this piece of this analytical is involved in a, almost every single aid category that we get to? <clears throat> this again is taken from um Frontline, it's called Procast 5. 
Uh, this is the Monroe County District, so we come in sixth out of 17 um, districts. You can see that um, Pittsburgh has a, a value of 1.14. Um, so again, just some comparative data. You guys can go back uh, after this and if you want to take a look at it um, at your leisure. But uh, any questions on, the, on this data? I don't know, pretend to have a, a deep understanding of the details that goes into these charts and things. But just a quick question is, I'm just, I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, it's probably not, a, it's a good thing that we're on the lower end of the scale on this because it affects the aid, correct? It means that we'll most likely more receive a little bit more aid because we're, we is can't. It, is it back in the previous slide, we just think it was the uh, combined wealth. Yeah. There, any, any explanation? If you don't have one, I don't need one. I'm just curious. 218, 219, it was 0.624. Then the trend seemed to be going down, and then it kind of shot back up a little bit here, closer to actually close, not quite up to, but closer to the 218, 219. Any significant reason for that or not? Anything we should be concerned about? So, I actually, in trying to anticipate the types of questions I may receive, right, I thought this may be one of them. So, Don, to answer your question, quite honestly, it's all driven by formula. So, for instance, okay. the formula for the 23, uh, 24. This is the formula that we take. So the combined wealth ratio, you take 0.5, you multiply that times the 2020 actual valuation, which is the full market value in 2020, divided by the 21-22, what they call total weighted pupil unit. I, I'm smiling because I'm, I'm here, but we're getting to the point where I really don't need further explanation. <laughs> That's my point. I'm, essentially what's happening is and then all of that's divided by the state average. So as the state average changes, all of that. So I'm good. You sure? Because I'm really starting to get excited about this now, Don. I, I can tell you already, you're the math guy. I'm not. Okay. So it's a good, it's a great question, though. Uh, and again, it, it, I think it just it proves the point that there are so many analytics to looking at, at, at how we're generating these aids. Um, that really, I mean, it can drive you crazy. You can lose your hair. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Similar information, different graphic points. We have what's called public and private access cost aid. I shared with you transportation and BOCES are expense driven aids. Again, you can see that for the most part, those are uh, relatively steady, which is a good thing, in my opinion. Our building aid, Again, um, based on the amount we spend in our um, capital projects, we're at about 80, uh, 87%, so another high aid ratio. Here's more state aid factors. I always love the one, the top one, the AOE per capo. So it's um, approved operating expense divided by the total aidable pupil unit. I like that because many times people will say, oh my God, you guys, spend $22,000 per student. What they do is they take our overall budget and they divide it by just one of our enrollment figures. This helps drive and take away that. So the average operating expense, they take out some of the expenses. So for instance, I'm pretty sure they take out some of the debt service so that it, it's a little bit more of a truer uh, cost <clears throat> uh, per student. Um, and again, you can see the, the orange is reflects expense report. The red respects the, uh, reflects the, um, the state average. And again, we are a little bit below that. Any questions as it relates to some of these analytical numbers? I didn't think so. Okay, pupil counts. I will share with you that you're probably gonna see, for those that really go back and look at this afterward, you're gonna see different enrollment numbers going across the board. And that's because there's sometimes they include private school, private or appropriate schools. Sometimes they don't. Okay. Sometimes they include charter students who attend charter schools. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they include um, students who are uh, home instructed. Sometimes they don't. What I really wanted to show is, is these are all the different uh, aid factors that are used throughout the different formulas. But you can see, and we're going to talk a little bit this about, look at what happened um, with our English language learners. Um, it in increased pretty dramatically, right? 
So you're gonna, we're gonna hear a little bit more about how that impacts the budget and staffing. I don't ties or anything you want to mention on the ELL or it's got all and the questions on yeah, pretty fun back yeah. <laughs> which is a good thing, um, to be quite honest with you. Okay, so <clears throat> here is um, again, this is a tool that we use. It's from Forecast Five and it helps us with our enrollment projections. So you can see. I have a scenario one, two, and three. So in other words, they call it the survival rate. So what would happen based on our current and prior year enrollment if you went out one year? What would then happen if we went out three? And then what would then happen if you went out at five years? And this is what you'll see. You could change that so that it's maybe a three-year, five-year, and seven-year. Uh, we have that capability. I just selected this. Um, for this exercise. Um, so anybody want to share with me what, with what they see happening in each of the scenarios? Romans coming down. Right. It's okay. yeah. pretty, pretty steady and flat, right? right. If, if not decreasing. What I thought was interesting was you look at the five year back at, in, in the 26, 27 you're actually at a higher value than you are at a three-year. So again, this just, I think to me, you know, okay, that's driving that. You know, it's obviously the numbers prior to that. Um, you know, what would happen if we did the five-year and then maybe a 10-year to see what would happen? So again, we use these to help project where we think we may be it's potentially going to help drive um, uh, staffing decisions. Question. Yep. So what what led to the three the three different scenarios? Like what is this just I mean, obviously it's using, you know, data to come up with it, right? But like, you know, why are these the three and why aren't they three others? You mean like three other why like yeah, why? five year versus seven year or just like what went into the scenario number? two versus scenario one? Like is it just this is a possibility? Like yeah, no, it's I mean it takes all the prior information, then it looks at live births and it looks at some. Um, I don't know specifically about the formulas that they're using to determine that. I have okay. to go back and look at it a little bit more in depth. Um, but they may use some averages and, and the like. Um, but that's just sort of what what is being reflected based on those criteria. So it's not getting into the nitty. Like if this were to happen, this change, like it's not looking at eventualities or like potential things. It's no, it's it's just a, it's okay. an indicator. Okay, um, got it. You know, to now. I was I don't use this particular model when I present to the board in uh, October after Vets Day. We use a little bit different model that was used by my predecessors. And I will share with you that it's pretty gosh darn accurate. Um, you know, less than half of a percent is when we're looking now um, at least from one year to the next. Now, obviously, the further you go out, that's not always going to be the case. But they've been pretty, pretty darn close. So Rob, this, this may help, I, I don't know if it will actually, but this is, again, this is the information that was um, reflected before, but it's by grade. So now you're able to see what's happening at each grade level, okay? Then when you add in the projection, you can just sort of see what's happening at, at each grade level. Kindergarten is usually one um, that is usually a number that you, know, you just never know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you try to factor in um, move-ins into that nature. But again, it's just a, a tool that we use. I know a lot of people like to know what's happening to them because a lot of times the next question is, how do you determine what's happening? How are your expenses going up? Are they going down? Is your staffing going up? Is your staffing going down? Before we get to that particular slide, again, just the same enrollment information presented a little bit differently. And this is by school versus by grade. Anything you guys see there that uh, you find interesting? Which one's sort of showing the most change? 
the other area is color. Right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. I, I'd look more at the high school. But again, you know, tools that we use that again play a large factor in what we do as we develop our budget. Um, and as we receive certain aids, our what they call instructional material aid, which you'll hear more about, is based on enrollment, different types of enrollment. Okay, I'm good. I got to put a clarifier on this is unaudited information. Okay, I did not go in and look at the details as to how these numbers were derived. This again is from forecast five. Um, but again, what I really wanted to share here is. I think, again, the next logical question we look at in Roman is, what's happening to your budget? What this particular graph or, or chart shows is the um, your, your average enrollment for each school building. It takes into consideration the FTE. Now, this is the part where I haven't really, I don't know specifically how they're deriving the FTE. Okay. It's most likely teachers, but does that include guidance counselors? Does it include psychologists? I don't know the answer to that. So you have to take this with a grain of salt until I'm able to digest it. Um, it shows what the average salary is, and then it shows what the student per FTE is. So again, I think if you're that interested in this, um, it will be posted. You can take a look. Um, I may have an opportunity to digest a little bit more um, and certainly come back with any questions you may have. Okay. All right. Given the time, uh, I think we're doing all right. So the next section really is we just wanted to give you and share with you some information that's related to um, the Amazon pilot. So this is the tax cap formula. You guys are going to know everything you want to know about the tax cap formula next week, uh, next meeting. But just want to highlight a little bit about what may or could have happened. Okay, um, I actually uh, got some information prior to this meeting that I think is uh, for us um, beneficial. But if it doesn't go down that way, I'm going to share with you a little bit about uh, what may happen, and then the circles in yellow are sort of precursors. Um, for when we discuss this at the next meeting, um, you're going to see how those two values are impacting our tax cap dramatically. Um, and we're, I think we're going to have some really good discussion at the next meeting about uh, where our, our what's called an allowable levy limit will be and where people really want to go with that. So um, I, think I can see you're all on the edge of your seat waiting for the next meeting. That was the little bait. <clears throat> okay, so. The Amazon pilot. It's a 15 year agreement. It was to start in the school year, our school year of 22 23, so the current year. That equates to the 2022 tax roll. You sort of have to follow along what tax roll and what years they are. Um, and then for the town, they were supposed to start their, their pilot in 2023 with their 2023 town and county, which is the one we build that just went out. Hey, all of that's based on the 2022 tax roll. Okay, for those that don't remember, the pilot is a payment in lieu of tax. So in other words, in this case, they've met with Comita, with Mineral County, and they're promising <laughs> certain things as far as jobs and, and things of that nature. Um, and they're going to get a tax abatement over 15 years. You can see that um, in 23 through, is it 29? They're going to be exempt at 90%. So they're going to be taxed at 10. Now, the other thing with a pilot is that that comes off the tax rolls, what they call a section, the section one. And now it goes to what they call a section eight. Isn't that what section eight is when you're crazy? Yeah, maybe I'm crazy for saying it. I'm putting you guys to sleep tonight. So the um, town of Gates in 2022, the assessor de determined that it, the building was only 50% complete. Based on that, he did not move that property 
to the section eight, you kept it on section one. When you do that, that means it comes on like your regular home payment, okay? It's part of the assessment that we're using to determine the tax rate. Clearly the pilot says this should have started in 2022, right? So <clears throat> what is the potential to the district? What's the impact if they wanna hold us to that contract? The fact of the matter is the assessed value used to determine the tax rate was increased significantly. We did not issue a pilot, which then impacts our tax cap calculation, which created, which would create a lower allowable levy limit, which you could say you potentially overtax the community because you're over the maximum allowable levy limit. Everybody follow me? No. You will follow next next okay. week then because it's it, it's right. difficult without seeing what's happening um, within the formula itself. And when I, when I say no, but I trust you. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. Next week have numbers. Exactly. Next week we have numbers. It'll be a little bit um, for those visual learners. It'll be better. So, in the event, and I'm not going to belabor this because I I think we have a resolve to it. On an erroneous levy, districts are supposed to set that money that you quote unquote overtaxed, put it aside, and then you're supposed to use that the following year and the year after to some degree to calculate what your levy would be. Trust me, I'm still confused a little bit by it. I was on the portal. You have to submit this to the uh, comptroller's office. I was in over the weekend, just plugging in what I thought would happen to see where we would fall. Um, and I still have a lot of questions. I'm not going to go over this. This is an example of what would actually happen if you're really into it. And it's, it's posted, be more than, uh, you, know, you know, take your time, go through it if you'd like. I wouldn't recommend it because I think we have a solution. Option one was originally um, to revise the pilot, really extending the pilot one more year. So in other words, everything wouldn't take effect in the tax rule of 22 in our 22, 23 school year, it's going to take effect in our 23, 24 school year. And then when the county does their 24 town and county tax rule, that's ideal. That means no changes for the school district, it means no changes for the town. And for the benefit of Amazon, they're probably going to pay a lower portion of their taxes because the value of the property is only a 50%. So I got word that this is um, this looks promising. Uh, I have my fingers crossed because if not, this is, the pilot agreement stays as is. I need to reach out to the office of the comptroller to really determine how this is going to impact what the 23-24 maximum allowable levy limit will be, um, which has to be submitted by March 1st, which really helps drive a lot of our budget decisions. Just curious, who? Who kind of has a voice at the table when we talk about whether or not that pilot's going to get the pilots? Right now, the town, county, and school district, and Amazon. Okay. We had a, a Zoom meeting um, earlier in the week okay. with all of those parties because they're impacting yeah. um, each one. I mean, you know, again, if things didn't work through, what I was understanding was that the county has to go to their legislature and get it approved because. It technically should be on the section eight, not the section one, but it's included in the section one. Trust me. Um, if Amazon can will agree to uh, to extending it one year, um, we'll be golden. Okay. Quick reminder: checkpoint three is on February twenty eighth. We're going to do a lot with the tax levy limit and the revenues. Checkpoint four on three fourteen. Update on any revenues. We're really going to get into some of the expenditures. Checkpoint five, 328, we're gonna <laughs> need B, we'll go and continue that expenditure discussion and really put together and share with you where we're gonna be as our preliminary budget. Uh, and then um, the last meeting, uh, April 11th, will be at six o'clock, but that's when the board meeting starts as well. So you're welcome to attend to hear the conversations, to hear the superintendent's recommendation for the budget. And I'm sure the board will be very, um, uh, curious to hear what the budget uh, focus group has to say. 
So with that, uh, any more questions? Again, I, I hope next meeting is going to be a little more interactive and not just me up here you know, providing a lot of information to you, um, although important. Any questions? All right, well, thank you for sharing your Valentine's Day with, with us. Uh, I hope the chocolates helped. And um, we'll see you next meeting.